I find uh, very interesting. Uh, I know that a number of you were asking questions about, you know, how can we be more positive, right? Because I, I think after our week and a half on genocide, we had had about all the negativity that we really wanted for that for that period of time. Uh, horrible things happen in the world, and they continue to happen as we speak. But what about the more positive things of uh, peace psychology more generally? Uh, for that, we have brought uh, Don Pett. Don Pett is a uh, MD by training. He's a psychiatrist. So we brought a psychiatrist on, I guess, peace psychiatry. But I'm going to leave it uh, to Dr. Pett to uh, do the presentation. Thank you, David. Does everybody have one of these handouts? If not, if somebody comes late, uh, maybe you can. Just Let me have one. Of them. Yeah. If anybody comes late. Great. Okay, uh, I am Dr. Positive. And uh, today you're going to walk out of here the most positive you've ever been in your life. My name is Dino Ped, and I am a wisdom doctor. A doctor because I uh, spent about 24 years in education, including finishing up in medical school and then three years of residency in psychiatry at Johns Hopkins. So, and then I claim the name Wisdom to Wisdom Doctor because I've had the rare opportunity to share the intimate details of thousands of individuals on their journey to well-being. So what I'm here to share with you today is my collected wisdom. And I'm going to give it to you in my hand, which you'll understand in a few minutes. And it'll be yours to carry forth from now on. My goal at this meeting is to do what I think most good teachers want to do. They want to get you inspired and to get you to be ready to make your already significant lives really significant. Most people find that the most significant thing they can do is to do something meaningful to make the world a better place. Most people are very interested in four things. Happiness. Unconditional love. See if you disagree with any of these. Happiness, unconditional love. Abundance. We have certain needs. And peace. Those are the four things all people want. And then the question is, the puzzle that we have to solve, and I'm going to count on you to help solve it, why is it instead that our, war, our world is characterized by hate, instead of abundance we have scarcity, and we have war instead? The question is, what can we do to change that? Why does everyone want one thing, and yet we have something else? So my goal for today is to do a couple of things that I think you will enjoy. Number one, I want to, tell, I want to share with you my idea of the causes of war and more important, the cause of peace. And the second thing I want to do in this course is to give you the two secret skills that will make you happier and more loving than you ever imagined that you can be. Would you all like that? Sound pretty good? Okay, so let's start. If you pull out the first three pages in your packet that I gave you. Now what I say is an opinion, but you understand, there are lots of explanations that are offered of why we have war and why we have peace. So you can, mine is a common sense approach. You can accept it, compare it with others. I'm not saying this is the only way, it's not only the right way, but it's one way that I think will work. So this is what I have to share with you today. Now, we can summarize the cause of war in one sentence. I'm going to make it as simple as possible for you. The one sentence that is the cause of war is, my way, the only way. The reason we have that sentence, and most people believe that, is because of the language that we all learn as children. Everyone in the world learns the language that is the silent disease that is more dangerous than AIDS, cancer, or the plague. That's quite a statement if you think about it. We have, are all harboring a, a contagious disease that is more dangerous than cancer, the plague, 
uh, and virtually anything else that you could imagine. Either or thinking. So we all learn to think that there's one right way, and if it's not our way, then it's the wrong way. Good or bad, right or wrong. Now if you look at the chart here with the symbols, I want to show you that we have thousands of symbols that teach us from the time we're born to think in terms of two categories. My way, the only way. One of them that's very popular are our religious symbols. Religious symbols basically say we know what God wants and if people don't accept our God or our way of thinking they're basically the other side and unless they come over to our side they don't deserve to be rewarded or to be a part of our group. The second group are patriotic symbols. How many flags can you think of? Virtually every flag says that our country is the is the dominant, predominant, or ought to be the leading country. And we learned to show allegiance. We pledge allegiance to the flag regularly, to our flag. Another symbol besides our flag are certain symbols such as the swastika. The swastika says, as you, is one of the clear symbols. It says, my way, the only way. And then there are patriotic symbols. Virtually every country has their, their, their political flags and, and figures. So, if you see what's going on, you read the papers, you realize that our Democrats and our Republicans are more interested in winning their way rather than finding solutions. Doesn't that seem appropriate or reasonable? That we seem to be divided and if you don't, once you're a Democrat or Republican, if you don't agree with your party and support them, then you are, could be ostracized. So we have lots of universal symbols that we all learn in growing up. Now, can anyone think of any single symbol that we have that teaches unity, that teaches that we're related, that we're all one, we've come from a source, and that we need to cooperate together that has the same emotional effect as, let's say, the Christian cross, or the Muslim crescent, or the Jewish star, or any other, or, or your American flag, or whatever. Can you think of a single symbol? You could say, well, the peace sign might be one, but the peace sign doesn't really convey the emotional impact that, that usually a religious symbol does. A religious symbol tells a whole story, doesn't it? And a lot of our symbols, if we begin to understand what is it that we learn, what is our major way of thinking that we have? Because we, we, Einstein told us if we're ever going to save our world, we have to do one thing only. We have to teach ourselves a newer way of thinking, which I'm going to show you how to do today. So let's take a look at the symbol that most, most is mostly supported by our Bible. So that's if you look at the bottom graph down here on the page, the first page. What does it tell us? What is the basis of our major belief system? Basically the Bible and most religions say that the world started about 6,000 years ago. What happened before that is questionable. But and a magical event occurred. God came, and on six days he created the universe, and then he rested on the seventh day. Most of you have learned that story, is that correct? And then he created human beings on the last day. Human beings. And our God is usually represented as a tribal symbol. Why is he a tribal symbol? Because most religions, God, say, if you do what our God says, and you obey his commandments, and you're a good religious person obeying our God, you will be rewarded in heaven. You will be given a happy afterlife. Quite a nice benefit, a nice penny. And if you make the appropriate prayers and sacrifices, uh, then you will be rewarded, and if you don't, you will be punished, and the place of punishment is not a very nice place to go for eternity. But it's a rather dependent God, isn't it, where you have to do certain things, and you get rewarded or you get punished, so you are created as a human being, and there you go through your life in that particular manner, as a human being. Now that's the symbol that most people believe in. And it also says that our, if our God is a tribal God, 
who is jealous of others' false gods, uh, then you better you better be allegiant to our our own god, or else you may not be admitted to a, a good hereafter. And many religions essentially say that that uh, unless you follow the, our legion to our God, then all other gods are false gods and you will be punished. Now let's look at a universal symbol that I'm introducing, a brand new symbol for you to consider. It's called awakening to the law. It's an asymptotic symbol. An asymptote is a line that approaches an endpoint but never touches it. So if you see that the line starts here at infinity, if you look at time, not 6,000 years ago, I'm in infinity, and we go forward to 2014, we see it looks very different than the line that's supported by our Bible. Now what is this, why is this such an important symbol and how, does it, how do we interpret it? Until fairly recently, we, most everyone believed in the, in the biblical story of, that you see in the lower chart. And then, not very long ago, after two and a half billion years of life on Earth, first life on Earth was about three and a half billion years ago, there wasn't much knowledge known. We traveled along for a long period of time for several billions of years before we developed the idea of evolution that said somewhere long ago in the past we started maybe as a single cell and in the course of time there were changes that occurred and it took a long time and then we finally got into the stage where there were two sexes at first there was just amoeba you know that divided and the most important thing for survival the most important thing for survival in primitive times was to be able to reproduce. Because if you couldn't reproduce, you wouldn't survive. And the amoeba were had, you know, it was pretty easy for them to reproduce. All they had to do was split. And you can imagine if you split into two, and those, those two that split, split into two, and those two split into two, you can make millions and billions of specimens in a very short time. <laughs> but over billions of years, we got more complicated so that we developed into two sexes, and two sexes make sense because you can have one sex that goes ahead and provides security and food. And since we have a complex organism that takes years, you all take years before you're able to support yourself, until you get to the age where you're, <coughs> the age of maturity where you can support yourself, somebody has to take care of you. So all of us are born as dependent crybabies, right? And you need somebody to love you to take care of you or you would not survive. But in the course of evolution, we developed into two sexes. Very interesting situation. We've gone from one cell over a period of two and a half billion years to now we are composed of about, of about uh, 50 trillion cells. Quite a pro progress. When I was in medical school, we were told the brain had 100 million cells. Today, most people think that the brain has 100 billion cells plus all the axon and dendrites to make it a very complex uh, organ, organ. A lot of very interesting specialization. Do you know the male makes 20 million sperm every day? And how many eggs does a female make every, day, every month? One, right? That's what I call specialization. And when, when the female is pregnant, there are no eggs produced for nine months or so. So here you have one species who has muscle who is stronger. You have a female who makes one egg a day and is, has special hormones and special features so that she can nourish the child to maturity. And when we see in lower animals, you can virtually turn off those hormones. And they do turn off, and that's when usually the female lets go of her offspring, and the offspring flies off. And achieves independence. So what do we see now in this timeline? If you look over to the second, just to the second page, you'll see that our galaxy began, our universe, about 14 billion years ago. 
Life on Earth began about two, three and a half billion years ago. About two to four million years ago, which is almost an instant in historical time, we developed the hominid brain, the first sign of what we call homo, the homo category of species, our ancestors. And then it was only about 150,000 years ago that the brain, the human brain, developed in such a large size that we became called Homo sapiens sapiens. Why two sapiens? It means that we are the species that knows that we know. It's quite a difference. It's one thing to have consciousness. It's another thing to have self-consciousness. And then about 50,000 years ago in the evolution history, something very interesting happened. Our ancestors developed language. And language consisted of symbols. And because we have symbols, we can think about our thoughts. We have the beginning of imagination. Einstein told us the most powerful thing in the world is imagination, because imagination can bring us an awareness of things that aren't even real. We can create ideas, and that's the basis of our creativity, the fact that we can imagine anything. It was the beginning of us becoming not just dependent species, but creators. You all now, whether you realize it or not, are creators. You have the ability, using your mind, to introduce things into nature that have never been here before. <coughs> and you can introduce hate, you can introduce bombs, nuclear bombs, or you can introduce warfare, or whatever. Or you can introduce elements of peace. The elements of warfare, for the most part, we started with slingshots, with slingshots and with bows and arrows and so on, bombs that kill a few, now we have bombs that can destroy everything. The Hiroshima bomb was the equivalent of 20,000 trucks with 10 tons of dynamite. Can you imagine that? 20,000 trucks with 10 tons of dynamite scattered around Hartford. One of those bombs that hit Hiroshima hit here. Today's bombs are roughly 50, well, let's say maybe 20 or so times. So we're, now we're talking about 100,000 trucks. And some years ago, the Russians set off the biggest bomb that was ever exploded, 50 megatons, which I think was the equivalent of about 50 million trucks. That it was so powerful that the people who were designated to make the bomb, by, by Khrushchev to make the bomb, were afraid to do what he said to do. He wanted to make a 100 megaton bomb because they were afraid it would change the whole atmosphere of the Earth. So we've reached an age now, if you look at this graph, you see how we've developed over time. Now, I mentioned language developed about 50,000 years ago, and 300 years ago was the most dramatic thing that began to change everything. After three and a half billion years, we developed the scientific method. And now we're learning more rapidly, we're becoming more powerful than we've ever been before. So powerful that now one individual has the ability, if he says the right word or pushes the right button, can destroy <coughs> virtually everything in the world. There are enough nuclear weapons in the air and the atmosphere today to destroy everything on Earth that we understand as civilization ten times over. And it could be done by, by a single person who's rather uh, devious. It could be done by a mistake. If, if our president or any president who, or any leader who had the availability of these weapons was told that someone had released nuclear weapons against their country, he would have no choice but to release all of their own weapons. There's no second chance with these weapons. This is different than anything that's happened in history. We live in a different era today, and you live in that era. And it's going to be more likely because now if there are eight or ten countries that have these weapons, soon most individuals, most, most terrorist groups will have them. And uh, according to this study, this was a study of the world at risk that was authorized by a high level, uh, by, by the Joint Committee of Congress, our Congress, to make a report to President Obama of the status of our weapons of mass destruction. And the first sentence of that report basically says that we can expect the use of a weapon of mass destruction before the end of 2013, and probably in the lifetime of our, either ourselves or our children. And some of the experts say we have maybe five or ten years to get our act together. Behind the nuclear weapons, we have global warming. We have, uh, we have uh, 
starvation, we're depleting the seas, uh, we have radiation, we have all sorts of other problems that we say are, are going to be right behind that within time. So, many of you are interested, you have the first page of this report in your packet, uh, and it includes that recommendation. Now, in 2013, we did have a weapon of mass destruction, didn't we? We had the release of chemical weapons. Now, what this report also says is that we're more likely to have a biologic event than a nuclear event. It's hard to make nuclear weapons in secret. It's not very difficult to make biologic weapons. And these weapons can be very, uh, are so powerful that a small amount, someone estimated that just about a, a big cupful of certain of these chemicals put in the correct location could be sufficient to destroy everything we know in the world. Okay, now if we go, if we go back a bit, we want to look at how evolution tells us something about our life situation. We started with a single cell, we went to, we went to, uh, it took about two billion years before we got to the level of bacteria, and then it's, we're, we're up to a fairly recent time, we said it was only 150,000 years ago that our brain developed to the size that it became such a powerful organism, organ. I call it our freedom organ because it gives us the opportunity to do our own programming. We are self-programmers. You are going to be or are becoming rapidly self-programmed to determine what you want for your life. That's that's the exciting thing. You are you are creators now. You're going to be in charge of whatever you make of your life and what you do for this world for now. As we developed into more complex organisms and we had to nourish, we had to have a, some species that would nourish their, their offspring to maturity, otherwise we, we would, wouldn't survive. Um, somebody can hand them this, you can have this if you want. Whoops, sorry. So now with the development of, now with the development of, uh, of the scientific method, you know what's happening. Things are changing change and go fast. When I was a kid, we were amazed at the first television set. The idea of, the, of, a, of something on our watch that could talk to other people and communicate with other people, or one of these things was unheard of. And all this has developed very rapidly. We communicate so rapidly, and we are growing in power. So if you look at the asymptote, asymptote of chart as a symbol, you see what it tells us is we've started from one source, we're all related, we all have a long history. And then we reached a point about 300 years ago where the whole curve has changed. All of a sudden now we are developing, rapidly developing knowledge. And knowledge is power. The more knowledge we have, the more power we have. Not only physical power, but spiritual power, mental power. Until we were able to think about our thoughts, we didn't introduce spirituality. We didn't, we didn't, I mean, animals don't, aren't, aren't very spiritual. You know, when the owl or the hawk or, uh, or the eagle or, or the predator fish or predator animal robs the other bird's nest or kills the other animal for their own survival to eat, he doesn't usually, as we think of it, have remorse. He doesn't say, I'm doing something evil or bad. I doubt if there's such a sense of evil. But most animals travel in packs, they join a group, and then their group enables them to, to survive. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to survive. And if you were an individual in primitive times, it would be difficult for you to bring down a, an animal. Think what our ancestors had to live in when we had no agriculture. We had no homes. People were wanderers. There was no, you couldn't go to the vegetable market and there wasn't much growing on the fruits, on the fruit trees. So you survived by what you could kill. If you could kill a whale, you could, you could last for a long time because you get a lot of food out of a whale. One person would not likely be able to kill a whale, but if you had a group of people together, they might be able to find a way to land a whale or to land a bear or whatever the particular animal was of the day. Now, what do you think was in the educational system of those kids in primitive times? What was their vocabulary? What did it consist of? What would you think? Would it be uh, philanthropic? What can I do for my neighbor? Would it be, how can I survive? So if we look at 
what we learned, our ancestors learned, they were preoccupied with what could we do to survive in a very difficult world. And in order to survive, they had to be on their alert. They had to be ready for an emergency at any moment. And they realized that they had to come together as a group. Now, in the course of development, we developed six. The brain is one related organism. You realize that. <coughs> there are segments. I mean, if you look at it, it looks like a big mass. But we can identify certain segments. And there just so happens there are six segments that we call the animal brain. And then there's the last segment, which is the cortex. And we said that the, the brain of the hominid brain, which was about a pound and a half, in a short period of time, in two to four a million years, has grown to four and a half pounds. From a pound and a half to four and a half pounds. There's no other organ that has grown that rapidly. So what is nature trying to tell us? Something about the importance of our ability to use our brain and our ability to think. A lot of people don't believe that. A lot of people think the heart is the most important organ. And there's a lot of people that are in the peace movement talk about heart resonance and how the heart is their inspiration and the brain will trick you. It tells you the wrong things and so on. I'm going to offer you an idea why that's not particularly the case. But as the human brain develops and we have the ability to use symbols, what do you think happens to that brain? Who controls the brain? Think about it from a point of going from A to B to C. When the brain is first developed, when we're born, who controls our life? The animal brain or the human part of the brain? Is it the, the, the six parts of our animal brain are listed here, the, the pons, pituitary, pituitary, the, the uh, pineal gland, the cerebellum, and the thalamus. These are all these are all pre-programmed, uh, they're pre-programmed pre 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 when we're born. In other words, we already have what we call instinct, how to protect ourselves. My wife and I went years ago to, the, uh, to, uh, to, to look at the, the, the uh, what is it, the, blue, the boobies, uh, what are they called? The, the, the birds, you know, the, if you have two birds in the nest, one of them kicks out the weaker bird and only one survives. It, it's sort of a good example of human nature. On the Galapagos, you know, which is rather, uh, rather primitive, people aren't allowed to go there, but you can actually see where the survival of the fittest becomes important. Well, the animal brain basically is, it tells us uh, might is right, survival of the fittest, uh, you are more important in your species, is what counts. It doesn't matter what other species are born. That's what we inherit at our birth. Then something else happens. We are, we are brought up by nurture. We're given a language. We're given a religion, right? You're given all the symbols I mentioned at the first part of the page. So now you've become either-or thinkers. And this is the way most of us in the world are thinking, either-or thinkers. My way is the right way. And then later, when you develop language and you finally reach the adult stage of life, finally you develop the ability to think for yourself. You have the ability, if you use it, to acquire mental freedom, to become your own person. And that's what's so important, what I hope to share with you. You have the power now to become creators and determine what's going to happen in your own life here. What a marvelous opportunity, freedom. Most people will die for freedom. And most people don't have freedom. In the Civil War, that was the bloodiest war we know. People killed one another over the issue of freedom of one's muscles. Not of one's mind, freedom of one's muscles. It took <coughs> millions, it took, uh, I, I don't know the exact number, but I suspect there were millions of individuals who died in that Civil War, brother against brother and so on. And what were they fighting for? The freedom of one's muscles. Because when the slaves were free, they still didn't have education. In fact, and sometimes they were worse off than before because they had no opportunity to get an education. And they were pretty much kept uh, as slaves, as servants. So just to have freedom of your muscles, at least you had muscular freedom. But it took a long time, and we're just now developing the opportunity to have mental freedom. 
you all here now are in the process of developing your mental freedom. You are acquiring the education and the knowledge that will make you powerful creators so that you can determine what your life is going to be from now on. And if you think about it, there are three masters of each of us have in our life. The first master I've mentioned is instinct. You were already born with the animal brain that teaches you survival of the fittest, my way, the right way, uh, eat, eat, eat others before they eat them. It's basically what it amounts to. Kids are very self-centered. If you watch that, you can see where one kid will have no qualms about taking another's, another kid's toy. After you're born, you have a second master. <coughs> Your second master is nurture. If you look down the chart, you see tradition or circumstance or nurture. You're brought up, you're given your flag, you're given your religion, you're given your language, you're given your tribal way of thinking, told who to be allegiant to, and you have no control over that. Whatever you happen, circumstance makes of you, that's what you are right now. So here you have two masters in your life now. Think of your brain as an apartment house. And you have competing people living there who have different ideas. You have your instinct, which says one thing, is pre-programmed, and then you have a certain amount of civilized ideas or, that are basically contradictory to your instinct. Whereas instinct usually has the motto, if it feels good, tastes good, looks good, do it. That's basically what instinct says. Your, your nurture basically says if it feels good, tastes good, looks good, you better not do it. It's probably bad or evil. And there, that's the base of a lot of neurosis, by the way, that because we have that kind of conflict. But you have these two masters. Instinct and tradition, and all animals, all other life has that instinct. Now, let me ask you, how are we alike, all animals, all life on Earth? All life on Earth, what is it that makes us similar to all life on Earth? And my answer is that all life on Earth is an energy-producing factory. Think about it. All life produces energy. That's the one common thing. If you don't produce energy, you're a rock or you're dead or whatever. So all life produces energy. But what makes us, as a species, different than every other species? We have the ability to program our life. We have the ability to develop self-mastery. We become creators. We make things. We make cars. We make, we make, uh, we make television sets. We make, uh, we make spiritual things. We, we come up with ideas. We, uh, we introduce spirituality that animals don't have. What do we mean by spirituality? We mean love, forgiveness, justice, compassion, all the things we think of as humane. So what does this chart tell us, this asymptotic chart? It says that 50,000 years ago, we developed a language. We became self-mastery. We developed the scientific method 300 years ago. We became very powerful. And now instead of human beings, go back to our religious chart, we are, we are created as human beings, all of a sudden we realize we are humane, not human, but humane becomings. We are on the process of developing spirituality. Humane becomings. It was only a short while ago that Darwin introduced the idea of evolution. Before that, everything was pretty much related to the Bible, the biblical chart of creation. Now all of a sudden we have the idea based on scientific knowledge that was reproducible by people all over the world. See, most people can't all agree on one religion because we have so many different religions and, and although we all say there's one God, everybody's idea of their God is a little different than somebody else's God. But evolution is something that anywhere, anywhere based on scientific method can say, this seems to make sense. It's truth that we can discover anywhere. And what we discovered now is that we have started at one source, it's been billions of years, now we've reached a level and all of a sudden things have changed. If you look at the dramatic change, we've developed the scientific method and we have made ourselves powerful creators. So that we decide, we have joined nature and nurture now. So now we have a third mastery, what we could call self-mastery. We have endogenous master, that is our instinct, 
we have an exogenous master, what tradition and what our nurturers make of us, but interestingly, we have no word in our language that's complementary to endogenous or exogenous. That's why I've invented a word. When you say we have to have a new language. Mentogenous means what comes from our brain, what we initiate. We are creators. We initiate new ideas. And that's why we're so powerful. And that's why we are creators. Not only do we create constructive things, we are powerful creators of destructive things. And I believe we have free will. We have a choice of what we do. But if we listen to our old brain, our old brain says, my way, the only way. That's the one sentence that you need to remember out of this class. That's what we're governed by, my way, the only <coughs> way. Now, what's the sentence that will change all that? It's the sentence that comes from common sense from our higher centers. And this is the sentence I hope you will remember and will hope you will propagate it. What will make things better for me and you for now and the future? What will make things better for me and you now and the future? See, this is a problem-solving sentence. It's not based on there's one right way and one wrong way. It's based on somehow we're all related. And if we cooperate and we work together, we will advance our civilization instead of destroy our civilization. <coughs> right now, we're in a fulcrum. We're at a, some people have said we're already behind the t we're beyond the tipping point. It may be too late already. I'm an <coughs> optimist, and I hope you will be optimist and realize that unless we start taking action right away. So what I hope I can convey to you is we're beyond the rhetoric stage. We're beyond understanding the why. We now need to look at the what. What is it we can do right now that's going to make a difference? And what I hope to share with you is what you can do right now to make a difference. And that's what I, I hope to share with you. Now, in the course of evolution, we develop senses, right? You all know what the five senses that we think of, hearing, smelling, tasting, so on. You all, all aware of those, right? One of the things that my favorite professor, when I was at, when I was at Johns Hopkins, who was, was at that time, Jerome Frank, was the world authority on psychological issues of war and peace. And that's how I became inspired. He was my inspiring <coughs> teacher. He pointed out that he lived in Baltimore, as I did. And in one side of him, there was, uh, I believe, Fort Detrick on one side, and on the other side was uh, Edgewood Arsenal. One was making enough poison gases to destroy everything in the world, and the other was making enough poison chemicals to destroy everything in the world. And they stockpiled them at that time. And here he said, here he lives in Baltimore, and we don't even think about these things because they're out of sight, they're out of our range. Because our five senses, which are part of our animal brain, are designed to recognize differences. Local differences. We have to see the animal that's near us who could attack us. We have to see which birds have an instinct. They can identify a bird in the air that has a certain shape that's a predator bird and know to run and they can see the shape of a bird that's not a predator bird and they don't run. This is all based on instinct. But our senses, you see, can pick up differences, changes. And that's the level of our animal brain. Now our human brain, on the other hand, has the ability to use concepts to develop what I call mental, spiritual wealth, ideas. Concepts <coughs> that allow us to look at wide, deep, wide, past, and future. That's what's so amazing. That's our, 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 our human brain is a sense organ and a motor organ. And because we can understand the past, we can predict the future. We can intervene. We can do things to change the future because now we have a way to, to understand the past. So we now have this third master if we want to use it. A lot of people never develop this third mastery. They go through life being controlled by instinct and tradition. And they never get to the stage because they don't want to give up the old habit patterns. If it was okay for my mother or my grandmother or my father or my country, it's okay for me. And I hope you will not be so complacent, complacent that you will rather be willing to challenge authority. 
Now, I just want to say a little bit more about uh, the development of, of conceptual ideas. I've said the animal brain and the brains before that and instinct before that basically had the concept that might is right, our way, the right way. Now, about Several, years, several hundred years before Christ, the Buddha and Confucius came up with an idea that was kind of crazy. They came up with the idea of the golden rule. You've all heard of the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Love your neighbor as yourself. And about 2,000 years ago, there was this crazy guy, a real rebel, who introduced the idea that we should love our neighbor as ourself. Now that's really a crazy idea when you think about it. When all through that time the idea was eat or get eaten, might is right, survival of the fittest. That's the history of our wars based on that idea. My way, the only way. Then this guy came along and he had a new idea. Now what happens when people come up with new ideas? What happened with Copernicus, what happened with, uh, with Picasso, what happened with Lincoln. Uh, most people who come up with new ideas get punished. And it's usually hundreds of years or much later before society says, you know, maybe that was a good idea after all. So this guy who came up with this crazy idea, you know, he didn't fare too well. You know, they, they didn't treat him all that well. And neither do any other people who come up with new ideas until society begins to say, well, maybe our old habits aren't the right way. You know, we used to burn witches at the stake, didn't we? Because we thought we had the right idea. We did it feeling very justified. Well, after that guy came up and, and told us that we had this crazy idea, a real rebel, there was another rebel that came along. His name, you may not know, is Teilhard T T T de Chardin. Anybody know that name? Pierre de Chardin was a Jesuit priest. And, uh, the Jesuits are usually very independent. And uh, he was also a, uh, he was a, uh, an explorer. He discovered some of the first fossils. Uh, and he came up with the idea that well, Darwin had a pretty good idea that maybe there was something to this, but he added a spiritual component to that. He said, if I look at this history, this asymptotic curve, and see how we're changing very rapidly, I think that this is an indication that there is a supreme being, there is some first cause, and there's a purpose, and we have a purpose, and our purpose is to elevate ourselves above the animals. We are becoming closer and closer to a spiritual being, someone, and of course this is what all religion teaches, doesn't it? We're built in the image of God. But as a Catholic Jesuit priest, he, it fit right in, you think, with his religion. That, you know, we, we look at evolution and we want to accept it because it tells us something. It says, we are now evolving to a higher level, a higher state. We're becoming spiritual. We're changing ourselves. <coughs> We're self-programming. Now, he was censured by the church. He was told, he was put under house arrest. He, uh, he was not allowed to publish anything, his books, until after his death, and his books were published, and now they're very widely accepted, very widely known, and the Catholic Church now accepts them. As I said before, rebels often are punished, and then they are accepted. So by the way, if you have any creative ideas, you might as well plan that you're going to have a tough time. Because it's not so much coming to the revelation of a creative idea. The difficulty is conveying it to other people so they accept it. I'm having that trouble myself because I have an idea that's different than most people believe and I, a lot of people think that I'm kind of nutty. I don't think so, but I'm, I'm, I believe I'm right on, but you can decide that for yourself. So we have, we have moved along from a point where we have reached a new era in our whole history. In three and a half billion years, you all are living in the fulcrum point, right at the point where we're beginning a whole new era where we have become self-masters and creators of our future. 
we are now partners with nature and nurture. We determine what animals are going to survive and what will become extinct. We are going to decide whether we become extinct. Because if we continue to make these weapons and we proliferate them, it's no question that they're going to be used. This report says basically that we're losing the battle. These are the report of 250 experts who are the most knowledgeable people in the world who were surveyed by a high-level committee and the report to the president tells us that it's only a matter of time unless we do something dramatic. The purpose of this report is to inform the public we better take some action, we better do a damn fast. Unfortunately, the summary is about the only thing in my point of view that's worthwhile in this book because I haven't found anyone yet that has a solution, the solution which I believe is the correct solution that Einstein told us was the only solution that I'm going to offer to you. The kind of things they talk about in this book are that we should give people duct tape so they can put it around their windows in case a bomb goes off. We should become friendly with foreign individuals because maybe they will give us information that will help us in spy. The rather anemic, lame kinds of suggestions because in my point of view, most people have not come up yet with the solution. Yet everyone has come up, is preaching the solution. But we don't, we don't take the action. So what I'm going to tell you now, and I just want to see how much time I have. Okay. I want to give you the two secret skills that will change your life. In my lifetime career of having the privilege of listening to people share with me what works for them, I have created an educational curriculum that teaches people how to be happier and more loving. And it's free. It's available to you and available to anyone. And what I want to do now is tell you the two skills that will change your life if you will practice them. They're secret skills. They're secret because our society discourages them. It basically tells you not to apply these skills. And yet they make common sense and they are supported by the one standard of behavior that every religious group and every secular group recommend. There's only one standard of behavior that's universal that everyone across the board believes in. There are no walls. Everyone comes to the conclusion of the golden rule, some version of the golden rule. Love your neighbor as yourself, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And these are what every religion and secular group preach as the standard of behavior. The problem is no one teaches how to do that. And I'm going to teach you right now how to do that. You can agree or disagree with me, but if you practice what I suggest, I think you'll find that you'll get dramatic, instant results and you will make it effortless, effortless and automatic if you take what I call the 30-day love creation challenge, which I will give you. All right, the most powerful skill I've discovered is what I call emotional self-endorsement. Emotional self-endorsement. You all know you already have the skill, but you don't use it. You use it incorrectly, or you use it correctly, but not completely. What is emotional self, emotional endorsement? You know, if you see a dog or have a dog, you know how to get that dog to wag its tail and shake its behind, don't you? You know how to talk to that dog with the kind of emotion that gets that dog excited. You know how to do that to a baby, don't you? If you pick up the baby, you know how to get that baby to smile. When you go to an athletic event, what do you do? You shout, you stomp your feet, you get very emotional, don't you? You direct your emotion to other people. When you go to a musical event, have you ever had a time when you've gotten so emotional that you jumped up, clapped, or you've gone to a movie and you've walked away with tears? change your emotion, all directed to other individuals. Now let me ask you, how often when you get up in the morning do you look in the mirror and you say to yourself, 
damn, I am such a hot sketch. Is that what you say to yourself when you get up in the morning? Or do you say, I'm going to think of my achievements that I've made and I'm going to really feel good. I'm going to sing about my achievements because I have really, I've done quite a bit. I learned how to speak, I can walk, you know, I live in a country that's free, I live better than, I live better than the kings did a couple hundred years ago. We have antibiotics, we, we have all kinds of benefits here that I live with. I have roof over my head, I have good food, I go to a market. Where could people have ever done that? How often do you really think of that thing? You know why you don't? Because we are directed by our animal brain. Our animal brain is interested in looking at the empty part of the glass. Why? Because our ancestors, in order to survive, had to look at the empty part of the glass. If you go into the woods, you could be challenged by any moment, any instant that could take your life away instantly if you weren't on guard, if you weren't thinking to protect yourself of the worst thing. Our ancestor didn't laugh. Did you know that? Humor is something that's a recent invention. Art is recent. Music is relatively recent in our, in our history. Because we have a creative brain. We make things. We create things. Humor didn't have any benefit for our ancestors. You couldn't laugh and enjoy yourself if there was a predator animal waiting to eat you. You had to be on guard all the time. That's why we have what's called an emergency response. Certain things cause our chemicals to change rapidly <coughs> and we go into an emergency state, the so-called fight or flight response that's responsible for most of our, our, our physical problems. But now we have changed. We have the ability to do what the golden rule t tells us to do. Love yourself with the abundance. This is my version, favorite version of the golden rule. Love yourself with the abundance that overflows to enrich the world. Think about it. Love yourself with the abundance that overflows to enrich the world. Would you, do you do that? Or do you spend most of your time being your own worst enemy? Saying, I can't do that, it's too hard. Is it worth it? Will they like me? And so on. We start in life being dependent on others. We spend the first couple of decades of our life learning a tribal language, <coughs> learning to be dependent, dependent on others, and now you have finally reached the stage where you can be independent, be your own creator. So think about the opportunities that you have now. Now we go back to evolution again and I want to talk about love for a moment. And I'll come back to this most number one skill and then I'll give you the number two skill. Somewhere along the line when we developed two sexes, one sex that's powerful and goes out and protects and so on, and then another sex that is designed that has hormones and has a body physique to nourish the offspring until they're mature. We see that in animals. We also see it in humans. By the way, what's make, what is it that makes women and men equal today? <coughs> women have the same power in their brain as men do, maybe even more. Someone gave a story that, that they had the opportunity to buy brains, to replace their brain, and they went to one section where they were selling brains, and they were, they were very, very inexpensive. And uh, they said, that's pretty good. And they said, let's go over to the high price search, search store. And they went over and had all these high price brains. And they said, well, what's the difference? They said, well, these brains are for males. They're more expensive. And they said, well, how come? They said, well, they've never been used. <laughs> Which some women, I think, will agree with. <laughs> OK, so we, somewhere along the line of evolution, we developed erotic love. I said that the most important thing to nature was for the amoeba was to be able to reproduce. Think about <coughs> plankton. Plankton have one purpose in life. They make themselves millions and millions of people so the big fish can come and eat them. That's their purpose, to reproduce, to provide food so that one big animal now can survive by eating millions of these plankton. Plankton have a marvelous role in life. The question is, what is our purpose? Our purpose isn't like plankton to make ourselves so we can be eaten. 
And maybe we have a higher person as Teilhard de Chardin holds. And then after we developed, after we developed erotic love, and we became so complex that it took us two decades before we were ready to support ourselves, then we had to develop another kind of what we call it filial love. We had to develop the ability to nourish. Some part of us had to develop the instinctual skill to nourish our offspring until maturity. That happens to be for the female. It's not that males don't do that, but characteristically, it's the female who takes care of the young and protects her animal. Don't bother a bear who's protecting, a female bear who's protecting her cubs. You're in trouble. And then we have the third kind of love that develops. It's called tribal love. Tribal love is the, the kind of love that's, that's a negative love. You love your flag, you love your religion, but it says, my way, the only way, the right way. And we're all brought up <coughs> instinctively and automatically have erotic love, filial love, and tribal love. And then just within a couple thousand years past, we finally introduced the most recent form of love, which has been called agape love, universal love, uh, unconditional love, which unconditional love starts with loving yourself. Now, I gave you my definition of the, of the golden rule, love yourself with the abundance that overflows to enrich the world. In other words, it's hard to give away what you don't own. If you want to make other people loving to you, the way to do it, you've got to have enough abundance of love that you can love your neighbor as yourself. Most people don't do that. Most of us, most of us go through life is still being operating from our old brain. So what Einstein essentially told us is the only way we'll save ourselves if we can transcend our old brain, our animal brain, and move it to a higher level, to our higher brain where we can teach ourselves the golden rule, basically. Teach ourselves a newer way of thinking. The golden rule is all it amounts to is a newer way of thinking. Love ourselves with the abundance that overflows and enrich the world. So I've given you the first skill that society tells us is inappropriate. I had several patients, I'll give you one example of a man who when I described this in my practice to this individual, he said, you know, he said, I was very proud that I had developed uh, some software. It was one of the most important things I did. And I was I, I had some friends over and I wanted to explain it to him. I was telling him about how proud I was of, of the software I developed and share it with him. He said, my mother came over to me and pulled me aside and said, you should never talk about yourself like that, you're bragging. Approval only counts if it comes from someone else. Isn't that a powerful statement? And I bet most of you still believe that yourself. Think about our songs. Most of our songs, how could I get along if you don't love me? If you left me and you took the dog besides. Most of our song titles. Most women are very dependent on love from other individuals, and most men are dependent on approval for, for their prowess. We're dependent on others for what we think others will, will believe of us. Most of you are controlled and are restricted because instead of learning to love yourself with the abundance that gives you confidence, you are go through life depending on what grade you get in your class. Not on how well you know the information and how, whether you've done what you can, but whether you get a good grade. And of course, when you're in competition, when some people are going to get a bad grade and some people are going to get a good grade, you know, the way they scale some of the grades, some people are going to be losers and some winners, as long as, we, as long as we keep depending on our grades. So now I've told you the most powerful skill, learn to love yourself with the abundance. And the way to do that is to enthusiastically endorse yourself. The way you already know how to endorse a dog or food. Some of you will look at an ice cream sundae and say, wow, isn't that fantastic? But when have you looked at yourself in, in the mirror and said, well, aren't I fantastic? See, if you don't do it for yourself, then you're going to be dependent the rest of your life on other people approving of you. Now, if you go to my website at lovingmenow.org, <coughs> lovingmenow.org, I hope you write that down, lovingmenow.org. I have arranged for a local radio celebrity, Brad Shepard, to record 15 of the most powerful skills that will teach you to love yourself. One of them is 
enthusiastically endorsing yourself. And the second skill is related to that I call secondary endorsement. When you endorse yourself, you are doing the most powerful thing you can possibly do to take an old habit and, and change things. If you've been doing things a certain way and you do something once or twice, it's like trying to forge a path through the jungle. What would happen if you started to cut a path through the jungle and you stopped? It would only be a matter of time before the jungle would grow back and there'd be not a sign of your effort. But if you kept at it, you will eventually create a path. Now we know that behavior is <coughs> rewarded. If you're a psychology student, one of the first things you'll learn in psychology is a simple statement. Behavior is that's rewarded is repeated. Behavior that's rewarded is repeated. What is the third most powerful pleasure that most people experience? I will tell you, you can have your own idea. I say it's orgasm. What is the first and what is the second? Why isn't orgasm the first? Well, I think the first most powerful is direct stimulation of the brain by an electrode. We can do, we can find a place in the brain, the so-called pleasure center, and stimulate that area and, and a monkey will press the lever until he falls over with exhaustion. What is the second most powerful pleasure? It's probably the high of, of a drug, of heroin. A lot, my, a lot of my career has been working with drug addicts, and I found that drug addicts, given the choice of having a sexual relationship or getting a high on heroin, will prefer heroin to anything else. So from my point, we can understand why it's so addictive. Now think about it. If What would happen, do you think, if nature instead made orgasm nine months after the fact and a baby was born instantly. Would that change your behavior? Think about it. If a baby was born instantly, an orgasm occurred nine months later. Do you think that would change people's behavior? What if a law were passed that said, from now on, we're going to make orgasm illegal? No, no more masturbation, no more intercourse. By a show of hands, how many would follow, obey the law? How come? Would you all be law breakers? <laughs> what do you think? So, behavior that's rewarded is repeated. And if you endorse yourself regularly, it's one of the most important things you can do. So therefore, I'm going to give you another skill that's related to the first skill. I call it secondary endorsement. If endorsing yourself is one of the most powerful, important things you can do, whenever you catch yourself endorsing yourself, I want you to endorse yourself for endorsing yourself. Does that make sense? If you do something that's really worthwhile, endorsing yourself, learning to like yourself with abundance that overflows to love others. When you do that and say, I've done something really great, so now I'm going to endorse myself for doing something really great. So secondary endorsement is the way that you make the habit of endorsing yourself rapidly habitual. For 20 years you've been putting yourself down, you've been telling yourself that you're not adequate, you're not attractive enough, you do this or do that. If you really want to change that, secondary endorsement is a powerful skill that every time you endorse yourself, endorse yourself or endorse yourself. I don't know of anyone who teaches that skill. That's, I think, an original skill that I've come up with and I'm giving it to you. If it makes sense to you, use it. Now here's the second powerful, secret skill. Also that society does not endorse. In the future they may endorse it. Even though we even though we profess the golden rule, we tell people if you endorse yourself you're being egotistical, self centered. So people don't do that. They continue life being looking for other people for their love and approval. Now here's the second skill. I call it the reasonable best measure of self worth. The reasonable best measure. When you do your reasonable best that is the basis of emotional self-endorsement. What do you do now? Tell me if I'm wrong. What you do now is you judge your worth based on the outcome of what you do. Based on the outcome. Do people approve of you? Do they like you? 
Do you get a good grade? Does the stock market do well? Is the weather treating you well? Uh, are you popular? Are you the right shape, the right color? And so on. You develop, you, you've been taught all of your life and you had no choice because as a child, we don't have the ability to take responsibility for ourselves. So the most important second skill, a secret skill that society does not encourage is to assume responsibility for your own endorsement, to take responsibility by saying, when I do my reasonable best, even if it doesn't work out well, we learn by making mistakes. You all know the story of Edison when he said, how come you could, you could go on figuring out that tungsten was the only substance you could make a light bulb when you failed 3,000 times? How could you go on making all those mistakes? He said, I didn't make any mistakes. He said, I learned 3,000 things that you could do that would not make a light bulb. It's the way you frame it, the way you look at it. When you learn to walk, see, children are born with this instinct. When you learn to walk, you fall one way and you pick yourself up and you don't say, I failed, so I'm going to give up. You say, I, I leaned too far this way, I made a mistake, and now I have to push the other way. But later, as we grow up, we're taught that if you make mistakes, you're bad, and you better not keep doing those things because you made a mistake. The best thing you can do is somebody say, this is a failure way to success. Unless you fail your way a number of times, you don't learn. Most people who are multimillionaires have failed their way to success. They've failed many times before they've succeeded. So the second skill I want to offer you, and I know we're getting late. Can we take another couple minutes? Or? We have uh, five more minutes. Okay, okay. then I'm going to try to wind up. Okay, so what can you do now with these two skills? Why is it that you can become powerful creators and make it make your already significant lives really significant? Do any of you know the name of Bantam and Bess? Have you ever heard that name, Bantam and Bess? Bantam and Bess discovered insulin. Bantam was a physician and Bess was a student. When I was in medical school, I was sitting where you were sitting. I was a seed in a class learning. <coughs> And we had a lecture from Dr. Best. Dr. Banning had already died, but Dr. Best told us, as I'm telling you now, I'm not a Dr. Best or Dr. Banning, but as I'm telling you now, I've lived most of my life now, I'm going on 78. You are the seeds now who are going to take over. What Dr. Banning told us at that lecture, he said, even though I've done quite a bit, I really envy you. I envy you because you are just beginning. The sands of that clock are pretty full up there. You know, and you have everything ahead of you right now. You can become and choose whatever you like to become. And that's why I envy you now. And I said, that was inspiring to me. Wow, I am a seed. I'm ready to spout. You know the story of bamboo? They say bamboo, the roots take a year or two before they spread out. And you don't see much of the bamboo. And then in one year, they can grow eight feet. They've been known to grow eight feet in one year. You are spreading your roots right now, and you're just about ready to shoot up. You're just at that age where you're going from being controlled by instinct and tradition to now where you're developing self-mastery, self-programming to become what you choose to become. And what you can do, what I hope you will do, I hope I will inspire <coughs> at least a few of you, that you will become love creation teachers. You go to my website and Go to one seat, it will show you how to become a love creation teacher. It's the one thing that will change the world, what Einstein told us, and this is my concluding statement, we need a blitzkrieg. Do any of you hear the word blitzkrieg? You know what it is. Do any of you hear, what is a blitzkrieg? Yes. Lightning war. That's what we need. We need a lightning war by creating an army of love creation teachers. A war does not just have to be to destroy. We need an army of individuals. We need one million teachers, love creation teachers, who can change the world by the domino effect. We have the means through the internet to rapidly spread goodwill, happiness, kindness. And if my dream would be, if some of you all, if, if I can inspire you to get together, you have the opportunity on this campus to start a love creation army few people, Margaret Mead told us, 
Never doubt that a small number of committed individuals can change the world. It's all they ever, that's all that ever has. Every religion started with a small number of committed individuals. Every large movement. You have the ability to start a movement on this campus, and I hope it will be a blitzkrieg, a, a lightning war, army of war, where you will teach people, start some movement on this campus where you will teach other individuals acts of kindness, because you will make this program the most powerful program on the whole campus. You know, at Harvard University, it was either a psychologist or a psychiatrist who taught a course on happiness. I said the two most, two of the things people want more than anything else is happiness and unconditional love. This professor started a course on happiness. And, it's, and now it's the most popular course at Harvard. <coughs> the most popular course at Harvard. Why not make this course the most popular course on the campus. If you are inspired. And if not, that's okay. Now, I have one gift for those who are interested. And this is my gift if anyone is interested. I have, uh, I have in my hand, what I have in my hand is all the wisdom that I've collected in my lifetime, my 77, almost 78 years. And I'm going to make my, my gift to you if you want it. If, you don't, if you're not going to use it, I just want you not take it because it's something that takes a lot of time, a lot of effort, and I can give it to somebody else who is interested. But in my hand, I have a flash drive that has the equivalent of a three-credit college course of all the wisdoms that I think have been important that I've learned in my years of listening to people who've given me their wisdom. These are action steps, not rhetoric, but things to do that will show you how to be wiser, more loving, more compassionate. <coughs> if you want this flash drive, it's yours free, and I hope you will share it with us. So I'll come up here and I'll be happy. I've got, I've got enough for every one of you if you want it, and if you don't want it, then I'll, I'll say it and give it to somebody else. That's that. So I thank you for the opportunity. I've really enjoyed this opportunity to, to meet with you seeds here, and I'd like to see you sprout. Have a good day, everybody. Well, thank you, Dr. Pett. Uh, you have on the yellow sheet the website and also his email address. I know that a number of you have emailed other of our speakers. If you want to email him, uh, the, the address is there on that yellow sheet. Uh, see you next week, and we'll see if we have any self-endorsements. <laughs> <laughs>